and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? In 2015, when Mother's Quest was still just a dream in my heart, I heard an interview with an inspiring mother, Jada Salner, on the Good Life Project podcast. She and her partner had co-created what became in a short time a viral phenomenon and seven-figure flourishing business called Simple Green Smoothies, built on a premise. Add greens to a smoothie each day and see how it could spark change within. From that moment forward, I found inspiration in Jada's journey and know that her quest planted seeds for me to pursue mine. I noticed that she led with heart and followed her dreams while staying committed to being present for her daughter. I learned from her as I watched her bring forward the Simple Green Smoothies book that became a bestseller as she took to the TEDx stage, integrating her spoken word poetry into her message as she made the difficult decision to leave Simple Green Smoothies when she realized it was no longer fulfilling her, and when she pressed pause on her work to grieve and heal after a series of profound personal losses. Today, as the founder of Jada Selner Media Inc. and She Builds Collective and host of the Lead with Love podcast, Jada helps women build their businesses and their lives in a way that works for them with love. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, daughter, and dog, Beasley. And this week, she culminated another journey that spanned years that she allowed to slow cook in its own right timing. With the release of her new book published by HarperCollins, she builds the anti-hustle guide to grow your business and nourish your life. Before I share more, I want to introduce another incredible mother and entrepreneur, who has inspired me and also Jada over the years, Jennifer Kem. Hello, I'm Jen Kem, founder of Master Brand Institute, and I'm honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to Jada Selner, my dear friend, fellow influencer, and an incredibly intuitive business coach to women who want to live an anti-hustle life while building a thriving business. In her book, She discusses the importance of a success squad, a group of people around you who lift you up, cheer your wins, hug you when you're feeling down, and most of all, want you to win, 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 no matter what. Jada is that type of friend to me. And my wish for all of you listening is that you surround yourself with those types of people too, because you deserve it. Jada, I'm so grateful for your friendship. And so dang proud of how you've put on your best-selling author pants and went for it with this beautiful book she builds. Love you muchly. Thank you, Jen, for this lovely dedication for Jada. The joy and celebration you feel for Jada's success is so clear and made me smile as I listened. The idea of a success squad that I know you've been a key part of for Jada is just one of the concepts that we delve into during this conversation. With each epic guidepost we explore, Jada shares with heart, humor, metaphor, and tangible examples how she brings an ease-filled, anti-hustle approach to engaging with her daughter, to pursuing her purposeful impact, to investing in herself, and to building deep relationships, a practice she learned as an adult when she changed childhood patterns and decided to bloom where she's planted. Every chapter of Jada's new book and every epic guidepost exploration in this episode is an invitation for us to choose an intentional, empowering, and nurturing perspective for living our epic lives. If you've been seeking a more sustainable path, free from burnout and rooted in your well-being, I hope that Jada's book and this conversation help you claim a new way forward. Because as Jada says, Collectively, we know that the hustle culture isn't working for us. We build differently. We build with love. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Jada Selner, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast. I've been so looking forward to this time with you. I'm excited to be here, Julie. I feel we've had many 
micro connection moments. And this is a full dedicated time for us to go deep. Yes. All right. We're going to close the episode with acknowledgments, but sometimes I feel like I have to start with acknowledgments from the very beginning. So I want to share this with you. You were one of the first entrepreneurial moms out there whose story I was listening to even before I publicly launched Mother's Quest when I had finally declared I'm going to create this thing and I had this vision but it wasn't real yet and I so appreciated your honesty about your journey about your stops and starts the times when you felt stuck how you built something that ended up being so meaningful because you did it in community in relationship with somebody you cared about and how you brought that love and care to the community that you were building. And in many ways, you were a role model for me. So this is a full circle moment. And I'm really honored to have this time to talk with you. Hmm, I'm happy to be a part of a full circle moment. I, I love that so much. We're going to jump straight into the first question I ask every guest. Tell me a little bit about your own childhood and the impact that your mother had in shaping who you are today. Yeah, so I was born in Sacramento, California, and I actually never could really name, you know, when people would say, where did you grow up or where are you from? Because I have never gone to a school more than two years in my entire life. So from Sacramento to Oakland, to Alameda, to San Ramon, and you know, all these places being in the mm -hmm. San Francisco Bay Area, then Houston, Texas, and then Miami and Coral Springs, Florida, and Coconut Grove to Las Vegas. And when I became an adult and graduated high school a year early, I had moved to LA and took some college courses, but never completed any college degrees and then moved off to Kauai with my husband and our then one-year-old daughter and made our own full circle back to the San Francisco Bay Area as a family of three. So I just like to give that context because I think in my own childhood, moving around a lot gave me a lot of the skills that I have today of that adaptability, a lot of comfort with change and disruption. And it also, you know, some of the, I wouldn't say the weaknesses, but the challenges that I've also faced is being able to deeply connect with people because I was always uprooting myself and moving and leaving. And as a kid, I really looked at that as, oh, I, I get to restart. I get to start over again. So there was some comfort in that and being able to like, oh, if that friendship didn't go so well, well, I'm moving to a new place so I can meet somebody new. So that was the environment of my childhood impact of growing up of just always on the go, always moving. And as far as my mom, she was a young parent. She had three of us by the age of 22. And that I really witnessed one, a woman who was always working to provide for her family. So my mom definitely was, she was always working when, when we grew up, but she also made a lot of time to nurture my creativity and my gifts. So some of my favorite memories are going to see the Nutcracker in San Francisco and her driving us from the San Francisco East Bay to San Francisco, the city every Saturday for me to take my ballet classes and, you know, wanting to be a sugar plum fairy, one of the little kids under the big dresses. So even though that my mom worked a lot, put in a lot of hours to provide for the family, she really did make time to nurture my curiosity and what I was interested in. So whether it was buying a book or signing me up for a class and never really held me to be one of anything. Like it was really, if I changed my mind, it was okay. And she would nurture that transition, that shift. And I feel that I've really taken that on into my adulthood, as well as the message from my mom and my father of just to do work that you love. And that has really, really stuck with me. And even the micro jobs that I had as a young kid growing up. I'm curious about what the reason was for all of the moving. Yeah. So many times people ask, like, are you a military brat? Which I'm like, <laughs> why are military? They're not brats. And I, one of my best friends is from in that space, but they were not. My parents were just very young. You know, they met in high school, 16 and 18 years old. And I think they were just really trying to find their way. 
They did a lot of entrepreneurial pursuits, real estate, then timeshare, buying cars, fixing them, selling them, just really creative ways of how do you provide, you know, for a family of five at that time. So they've just, we're always just moving around. Where's the most affordable place we could live with really good school districts? So I think that was kind of the hunch that they would follow. And there's also some probably things that I didn't know, you know, in that relationship dynamic between my mom and my father too, that I'm sure contributed to a lot of the moving and hopping around as well. I was listening to an interview of yours and I can't remember if it was an old one I dug up with you on the Good Life Project or maybe even more the recent conversation that you had on Sparked, which you've been contributing to with Jonathan Fields. But I heard you talk about how this history of moving around in some ways caused you to, when things felt challenging, want a fresh start. And then it seems like you've come, you know, back to this full circle theme to both being open to fresh starts, but also seeing that sometimes it's good to slow down and stay where you are and figure out what's really needing to shift in place. Yeah. So I think that's the maturity that I've taken on in realizing that in the past, because that was part of my way of adapting to changing environments and moving is to get up and go. Something's not working. We should just leave and start over. And it was actually in 2012 when my friend Jen Hansard and I, we co-founded Simple Green Smoothies and co-wrote the book by the same name together. But we originally had a parenting blog called Family Sponge. And we weren't making any money from that blog and we never did. We were always in the red. And my husband was working back at Kaiser Permanente doing educational theater programs, which is how we both met. And we were just trying to figure out, like, how do I get this business off the ground, make money? And so we were considering moving to the Philippines. Let's go to a third world country. And my husband was born in the Philippines. So his Lola was there. And we were thinking that that would be a great escape plan, right? Of let's have lower rents, you know, we could live very affordably, we just lower the cost of living so that I could build my dream business. And then I remember just having this moment and I was sitting, you know, we were in our living room and I just said, we always go, you know, when something's not working, it's like we just get up and move to a different state, city. Now we were considering a country to kind of rebuild. And I realized that why don't we not have the uncertainty be in our day-to-day life? Like what school does our daughter go to? Where are we going to rent? And all of these things and creating more variables that are uncertain. What if we just let my business be the thing that is the uncertainty? And then everything else around us can be stable and we can be rooted. And so that was an invitation for us to really bloom. You know, there's Mm -hmm. the quote, bloom where you're planted. And so my invitation was for us to stay. And so we renewed our lease at that time for another year. We signed the contract and making that decision to stay versus having this bouncing around and where should we go? Always know there's an escape plan. We could just leave and, and run away from our problems. There was something very powerful in naming that that was a pattern of mine for me to kind of escape and go somewhere if things weren't working out and to sign a signature and say, we're staying for another year. Our kid is going to the same school for another year. And that is when my business really started to grow. I mean, in 2013 is when Simple Green Smoothies really, really took off. And it's because we chose to bloom where we were planted. One of the things I really love and appreciate about you is your use of language and metaphor. So this idea that you're sharing about being able to look at old patterns in new ways and choose a perspective for how you want to live your life and how that perspective of blooming where you were planted really brought you to another epic chapter of your life. So thank you for always sharing with Mm, us with transparency, what's happening for you and the thoughts and ideas that move you to the next level because we get so much from it. Thank you. And I will say that we ended up staying in that place for nine years 
and we still live in the same city. Like we're over a decade now and it's the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my entire life. So building this solid, stable foundation for our daughter, who's now 15 years old and is going to high school with kids that she's known since kindergarten is such a different upbringing than what I had. And of course, you know, I still have my dreams of let's do world schooling and travel the world together, but she's so rooted and grounded. So it's been really nice to create that sense of sustainable foundation for our family that feels so comfortable for us to lean in and unravel when things get hard. Yeah. I want to shift us into talking about living an epic life. This is speaking of metaphors has been the metaphor that I chose into a little over five years ago when I launched Mother's Quest, inspired by the hero's journey and the realization that so often as mothers, we put all of our energy into helping our children to fulfill their epic life dreams, but that it's so important that we remember that this is also our one life to live yeah. and that our kids learn so much more from our example uh, than what we tell them. So I'm going to ask you first what you feel like you've been on a quest for in, in your epic life. But then EPIC is also an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us to live that life when we're raising our kids. So we'll then go deep into each of these guideposts to hear what your pearls of wisdom are along each of them. So first, I'm curious about whether you resonate with the idea of living an EPIC life and what you feel like you've been most on a quest for. For sure. I absolutely love my life. I love what I have created and co-created with my husband of 17 years. And I feel that I am very committed to intentional living, which is being really clear on what I want to call into my life. And also, what are the things that energize me, that make me feel lit up and sparky? And what are the things that drain me? So my quest is really this constant, just weeding out anything that does not serve me and really being able to nourish myself to be the most loving, generous, present person that I can be to not only just myself, but to my children, children, my child, my daughter. I think I'm thinking about our fur baby Beasley, <laughs> which we're like, we call her part of our kids too, just to be able to be a vessel for love for love to move through me and how I show up for myself and for my family and for the community that I serve. And I feel that part of my epic quest or journey has been learning how to receive the love that I've been so great at giving because I think mm -hmm. I really do fully show up for people and I'm generous and I serve and I listen. And so my initiation and my own healing journey over the past couple of years being able to receive as much love as I give, how can I receive that type of love for others and not just offerings and gifts that people give to me? One practice that I put into place is anytime someone offers to pay for something, a meal, I don't try to do like, no, I'll, we'll split the bill. We'll do this. I'm just like, I will receive that. Thank you. So that act of receiving and also being able to ask for people to hold space for me. That's been a practice that my husband and I have been working on. Because even though my husband is super sweet and kind and loving, he's still learning how to listen and to hold space and not try to fix and solve. And so I'm learning how to ask for the type of love that I like to give to receive that for myself. And then to take that another level deeper is now I'm learning how to receive or give that love to myself without needing it from any external party, even for people that I know love and adore me, like my husband or my daughter, that if I don't feel safe or I don't feel seen, how can I do that within myself without needing to look for it outside of myself? Mm, so powerful. And I really appreciate how the idea of being on a quest to live a life that is also rooted in love is something that you have really drawn the lines to in your business. And I know that you have a book coming out. I think when this episode airs, we should all be able to get one and hold it in our hands. 
called She Builds, The Anti-Hustle Guide to Grow Your Business and Nourish Your Life. And I'd love to be able to pull out some of your words of wisdom that you share in your book and the stories that you tell as we explore these epic guideposts. Yeah. So the first guidepost, E, stands for engaged mindfully with our children. And this is really about how we bring thoughtfulness and intentionality to our mothering. Mm -hmm. What would you say is one of the biggest lessons you've learned in how to show up as a mom? Yeah, I think it's that presence, that holding space and finding how people like to be witnessed, to be seen, to be heard. And so some practices that I've been learning with my own daughter as she's gone from a baby to now a teenager, she's in high school, she's a sophomore, that I've learned what are the safe ways for her to open up and express herself, express her emotional landscape. Because, you know, as women, we can, if we're identify as female or socialize as female, there is a lot of society that can impose that we don't speak up, that we don't express ourselves, that we're quiet, that we create peace and harmony, no conflict, don't get angry, don't be sad. There's just all of these messages that come from our external world. So one of my practices with her is to really find these spaces for us to have conversations. And one thing that I have learned is especially engaging with young kids and tweens and teens is to have conversations where you're not making direct eye contact. So many times I will just have snuggles with her in the bed, even as a teenager, and just start to talk to her. And there's something in that where we're not sitting confrontational, looking into each other's eyes that she can open up. We walk our dog together. And when we're moving our bodies, it's also easy to the endorphins help us open up and share as well. And then we also do hot tub dates together where we'll go and sit in a hot tub and just finding ways to create some nourishing practices. That I want her to take with her when I'm no longer able to be with her on a daily basis, but also finding these meaningful ways for us to connect and for her to be witnessed and seen and heard and just really creating some safe non-judgmental, super compassionate, caring listening. That is a practice that I will do for the rest of my life with her. Mm, that is so good. And we just put a hot tub in. We invested in our backyard during COVID. We've spent so much more time at home. Yeah. And recently had an hour long conversation with our teen, who I told you before we pressed record is headed to college soon. But our almost 10 year old is also here with us and we have a lot more time to invest yeah. in listening to him. So I'm going to add hot tub parent child connection yes. dates to our calendar. Yes, it's just so much fun. And when we do it, we do annual review retreats as a couple. And we've been bringing Zoe with us on these last few trips. And part of our celebration at the end of the dreaming and the planning and the sharing is we'll end up in the hot tub at the end of the day, and we'll be in there for two to three hours. And I just love marinating in a hot tub. <laughs> it's my happy place. So good. Well, on the subject of marinating, I'm going to move us to the next guidepost P, which stands for passionate and purposeful impact. And I've started to read the PDF version of your book. I can't wait to read the whole thing when it's in my hands. But one of the things that came out clearly to me as I was reading from the beginning chapters about your impact in the world in terms of your business is your commitment to allowing things to grow, to simmer, to move slowly sometimes and to evolve. I'd love to hear more about there's like a patience and a faith, I think, mm. that comes in that. And alongside that, you've also been really committed to pausing when you need to or when there's something that's happening in your life that you need to heal from. Can you share a little bit more about your lessons related to the slow simmer and the pause? Yeah. So something I talk about in chapter one, which is detox from hustle culture, and I'm sure we're all familiar, which is the busy go, go, go and feeling like there's so much on our plate and we're not doing enough, earning enough, moving fast enough, all the things not smart enough. And so what I always like to say is to give yourself permission to be a slow cooker 
not necessarily a pressure cooker, like an instant pot. I remember when we first got our instant pot, I was just overwhelmed by all of the buttons and the toggles and the things and everyone was just raving about it. And I was just like, this is so complicated. Even though you're saving time, my brain is overworking in that concentrated amount of time. And I'm having to, you know, I don't know if you've ever cooked with a pressure cooker, but there's like burn notice. There's just so many things going on and so many alerts and things. And I was like, I don't want this. I just want our slow cooker back now. It's just so simple. Yeah. It's like, you want four hours or eight hours? And then just like <laughs> release it and let it go and just let the meal simmer. And so to me, I feel that there are a lot of people, especially if you're running your own business, is that we're operating so quickly and we're overcomplicating things. And we want this certain type of result. And so when I use the slow cooker and the pressure cooker analogy, you get the same result. You're going to have a delicious, nourishing meal, however long it takes you. And so for me, I'm like, why don't we go the more slow and spacious, intentional way and allow ourselves to move through our business and our lives like a slow cooker to let things simmer, to let it rest and not have to be on and touching and moving all the buttons nonstop. So it's just a different way of looking at how do we approach our businesses, our lives, and being able to extend the timeline. So I'm always saying, don't put a timeline on your dreams. You can put a timeline on your action of when you would like to get things done. You also still need to pay attention to your own energy. But I think that allowing ourselves to let things take longer instead of always needing to get the result right away. That's that instant gratification and also results that we don't actually have control of. So that's where my trust and surrender and letting things go is I have a very high intention of what I want. And then the timeline of how or when it's going to happen, I have no control over that. Like I can show up and do the work that I think will move me closer to that. So that is one approach to that. And then talking about the pausing. So there's a chapter in my book called Embrace Your Pace. And it's an invitation to think about what season you're in your life and within the work that you're doing in the world of, well, do you need to pause? Do you need to pivot? Or is this, you need to do an accelerated push? And I think when I say you know, the anti-hustle guide it doesn't mean that we can't hustle or that it's all wrong, but there are seasons in our lives and it needs to be an intentional decision when you're deciding to push a project forward where it's like, am I just avoiding this? Am I resisting? Am I fear of perfectionism or whatever those things are that are holding you back from moving something forward? So you actually need to put a little bit more effort and have a more support to kind of push a project to the finish line. And then as far as pivoting, there's sometimes when our hearts are calling us in a different direction. With me, with the company that I co-founded, Simple Green Smoothies, there was a season where I knew I could no longer stay in that business. And I was experiencing a sense of burnout, but not burnout in like the overworking way. Although I did have moments of that with working on our first book. And I was like, I will never do that. That was too intense where I was up for over 24 hours. I was pushing a little bit too hard, but I just knew my heart wanted to be doing the work that I'm doing today. And so I had to make a pivot from the inside out of what is it that I really want to do? How do I best express my gifts and where do I feel most fulfilled and that I can make the best contribution? And so I felt complete in that season with that company and knew that I needed to pivot away from it and do something differently. And then there's the pause. And that was something I know that you witnessed in 2019. I had some very big losses in my family. My father, who I had an estranged relationship with for over 20 years, had passed away. So feeling the grief of not being able to have any sense of closure or being able to reconcile that relationship together. So I was navigating that grief. And then we put our dog of 13 years who we had since a puppy from the rescue shelter that we had to put her down. And that was a huge grief for the three of us to be there and witness her 
And then just a few months later, my brother, my 16 year old brother passed away in a car accident. And this all happened within six months. And any one loss or grief is intense and it reorients your entire world, your nervous system, your emotional capacity. But when you have the compounding grief of loss, and I had never lost anyone in my family, blood, biological, anything like that before that. So it was like, whoa, I've never lost anyone. And now I've lost so many people that are close in my inner circle of my family. So I had to make some intentional decisions on slowing down in my business, slowing down on the book that I wrote. I was working on my book proposal, trying to get things together and just literally pausing on my podcast, my book, even my coaching program for a few months so that I could really show up and tend to my grief, show up for the logistics of grief that you have to navigate and really be there for my family. And that's something that I call an intentional trade-off where it's, this matters more to me than anything in the business could. And I was also torn. I felt bad. I felt like I was letting my clients down, but that was where I started to learn how to receive love. You know, coaches, my friends were like, I'll lead your co-working call. I'll lead that. Mm -hmm. I can lead a training and support your clients. And so really allowing myself to unravel fully and step away and receive that support. I think that we have to pay attention to do I need to press pause? And what is the support I need to put in place to make that happen? Thank you for sharing all of that with us. So much wisdom. I am also so sorry for your loss, the compound loss. My dad passed away in December and I definitely took at least six months mm -hmm. off of the podcast and other things on my plate so that I could be more present. And I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for you to hold all of those losses at once. And I'm really, again, grateful that you are open to sharing about your experience so that we can see your example and know that it's okay to pay attention to what we really need. Yeah. I want to move to the next guidepost I, which actually flows seamlessly from where you just brought us. It's about being invested in yourself. And you've already shared so much wisdom about the ways in which you slow down so that you can really listen to yourself and what you need, about the growth that you've had in your ability to receive from others. I also would love to hear about some of the practices that you have built into your life. I benefited recently from one of your practices the sneeze, I think you call it. Mm, the brain sneeze, <laughs> the yeah. The brain sneeze. <laughs> My husband and I celebrated our 25th anniversary and we went to Hawaii. And on that plane ride, because I learned from your example of this practice, I was able to just completely download all the things that were running through my head across all the epic guideposts. And it really cleared space for me to be more present. But share with us a few other of your core practices that have been really instrumental for you in investing in yourself and also finding that alignment when you are doing something like having to deal with unexpected grief or something that doesn't feel right. How do you get yourself back to center? Yeah. So for me, I feel really rich in relationships. And I'm even feeling it in this season as I'm promoting the book, asking for help, receiving help. And, and it's just like, oh, wait, this person said yes. What? Well, that's so weird. And, you know, there's just this feeling of like, no one's going to help me. I've got to do this all on my own. And, and it's just not true. But in chapter four of the book, I talk about gather your support squad. And I can say that investing my time and energy into building relationships with people whether they are a mentor or a coach or a life coach, therapist, my friends, peers, colleagues, business besties. And that's really, I look at support squad as a holistic support system that is supporting you emotionally and spiritually and being able to hold that psychological space that we're holding inside our heads and our bodies all the time that we, we are humans and we need to stay connected to one another. 
And so I will just say that is one of my richest resources that I invest money, I invest time to nurture the relationships I have in my life. And it's just amazing how many people that I can tap into and ask for support or ask for feedback on anything, whether it's dealing with teens and mental health, or I'm getting ready to record my audio book, you know, reaching out to author friends to be able to lean on and share like what their recording tips are. And I think that is one of the biggest gifts that I have given myself. And I really didn't start to make deep friendships until I became an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for 14 years now. So not until my late 20s. You know, I'm almost 40. I'll be 40 in 2023. So entrepreneurship has been a gift and for me to learn how to be friends with others and to go deep and to hold space, not just for business growth, but for our personal growth, for our marriages, partnerships, parenting, all the things. So to me, that is where I invest in myself the most is I'm really great. I'm a really great friend. And I feel that I get to receive that back. I feel that reciprocal energy of support back in me. I love that. The last guidepost is C, connected to a strong support network. And you have Mm. just just shared how investing in ourselves and being connected can be such a symbiotic relationship. And I love that you said that you're also a good friend. Yeah. And there's this way that when you intentionally put that energy out and you're open to receiving, it will come back to you. Yeah. And with the connected and support system of kind of the practicality, like what's the tool or the practice that I have in place to nurture those relationships that could be helpful for me to share is I have different levels and layers. And I share this in the book, but I'm happy to share this here of what we call from Think and Grow Rich. Napoleon Hill talks about masterminds where like, Two or more people together create this third mind that is able to generate ideas and solutions. So that's something that I practice. My first mastermind partner was a roommate of mine before I was married. And then I thought I was going to go back to college. And then I ended up, my business started growing and taking off. But I had my friend Tamika, where we would meet once a week, every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Kids were asleep. She was a single mom at the time. And, you know, I was Simple Green Smoothies wasn't quite started yet. I was in that in-between phase of what am I doing? What am I building? And that relationship was so powerful because we had this structure around us both sharing, basically splitting the time in half of, hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's where I'm struggling. Do you have any ideas or thoughts that might be helpful for me? And then committing to an action to take after that conversation and then follow up with that the next week. So that's just a great way, no matter what, if it's just with another mom and a parent or anything that you are trying to grow and deepen your learning in, you can have a mastermind partner, someone that you can share your deepest, wildest intentions, visions, dreams with, and then have them support you. And I do this in a lot of different ways now. I also have a crew of friends who we call the squad and Mm -hmm. we meet four times a year in different cities, countries. We all live in different places and we get together for, you know, three to four nights. We'll have a spa day. We'll eat great meals together and we'll talk about our businesses and our lives and wherever we are stuck. I also have a group of other women entrepreneurs where we meet once a year and we book an Airbnb. We stay under the same roof. And we have less structure, but we know we're going to talk about business. We know we're going to talk about our kids. We're going to talk about our partnerships. So for me, I love always having this additional structure to go deep in friendships and relationships where we're not just talking about the surface stuff in our lives. Like, how are you doing? How's the weather? How are the kids? But we're actually going like, I'm struggling with this and I'd love your feedback on it. And there's something different about kind of creating this structure and consistency of meeting and gathering of the minds. And so that would be my invitation for people to think about, is there one person in their world that they've been kind of having like a mom crush on or a friend crush on or just something where you're like, I like this person. I would love to hang out with them more, you know, to be able to start something that is a little bit more structured and consistent that you're always putting it on the calendar to prioritize connection and friendship and depth. Mm. I love everything that you're saying. 
And I also appreciate how this can look different ways that you have, you know, some people in your squad who you see more often and another group that you see once a year. I have found my very first virtual Mother's Quest Circle that I facilitated Mm. over four years ago now. We're all on a Voxer chat and we show up for each other almost daily in all aspects of our lives. And that's something that has been able to be a consistent vehicle for us to communicate. So it can look all different ways, but I love the invitation to be intentional and to create some consistency for this relationship. Yeah. And I would just plus one boxer because one of my friends that's in the one that we meet four times a year, Nikki Elledge Brown. She's the host of Naptime Empires podcast, which if you haven't interviewed her, she'd be a great person to talk to. Of navigating yes, I listen parenting. to her podcast. Yeah, but we box on the daily. We call each other Polly Pockets. And so <laughs> we definitely use Voxer as that on-demand chat, text, send gifts, photos, whatever you want. And I also want to add, there's one more structure that I have is that I have people that I mastermind with locally so that we all live in the Bay Area and we meet once a month on a Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have dedicated hot seats, you know, about 25 minutes each and we share lunch together. I just like to share all the different layers of you don't, I just love connection, an intimate, deep circle of people connection. I'm not a big, like big group person. I like to go deep with people. So I tend to have a lot of different groups of support, but you might just choose one of those, whether it's the Voxer, like what you have, or meeting with someone on the phone once a week. You know, you don't have to subscribe to all the different things, but I like to share all the different ways that I do it to give inspiration on on how you can create that consistency and connection. Before we move to the opportunity for you to give us a challenge, which I feel like you've already started to build for us, I want to go back to that Epic Guidepost I for a minute and ask you to share one of the other practices that you bring into your life when things are starting to feel a little out of alignment. What's one very maybe simple or tangible practice that we might be able to try? So for me, it's oftentimes if you're an overthinker, have a lot of ideas in your mind and your brain, and we talked about the brain sneeze which I share inside the book as well, or you can see the video of how I do it on my Instagram. But I need to move my body. I need to get out of my head and into my body and not, I don't love like working out and spending all this time. But for me, just five minutes of state change in my body. So I'll share some simple practices that I do when I feel my body is overheating. So that's something to also just pay attention to a signal, the way that your phone can overheat if it's Mm. working a lot or your laptop, paying attention to your own body and how it feels. So really trying to create some practices where I can get out of my head and back into my body. So in between calls, I will step out. I have a patio in my office space. Just step outside to just feel the fresh air or the sunshine. And I will set a timer to stand in the sun and soak up some vitamin D or if it's cooler outside, whatever it is, I just need my body, my skin needs to feel that sensory change. Or I play a song, a dance song. I have a fill in myself playlist on Mm -hmm. Spotify and all the music and artists that just get me like wanting to move and be sensual and connected to my body and just play one song. So it's like these five minutes of intentional state changes in the body. When I'm at home, I will lay against my couch. So I will lay on the floor and then prop my legs up. So it's kind of it's like an L shape onto the couch. Or I will prop myself as if you were in like a yoga class where you kind of like scoot your booty and like have your legs up on the wall or on a door. And there's something in that and allowing the blood to flow through your body. It's almost kind of giving you like a halfway savasana. And I will just sit and lay and allow my body to just like stretch and just be in a different position or lay on a medicine ball and allow my back to reverse from sitting Mm -hmm. position. So these are just like very simple. It's not working out. I'm not saying go like, you know, box for 30 minutes or run a mile for an hour, anything like that. So these simple practices on how we can stay 
in our bodies and feel the sensation that we are more than just our brains and thinking and processing and doing and saying, but to actually get back into our bodies and, and give ourselves those mindful breaks. Those are all such seemingly simple things that seem like they can really make a big change. And as you have a daughter entering her high school intense teenage years, one of the tricks we learned in working with my son during some of his really challenging times is how important the leg up, elevating your legs is actually a reset for your nervous system mm. and can really kick in. I think it's your parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, yeah. Bring down your stress. So we yeah. started doing, encouraging him to do that when he was having those moments. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, side note, but I I feel really drawn to somatic practices. I'm actually looking into like, how can I get trained and just learn? Because there are so many things and there's so many chronic stressors in our lives. And to bring ourselves back into our bodies, that's not about exercising or trying to change our bodies, but just to regulate our emotions and our nervous systems is, is so important. So thank you for sharing that with me. And yeah, I've been trying to teach my daughter some self-soothing strategies because I feel as adults, we're just learning them right now. No one's taught us these things. And it's like, oh, these are really important tools to have. <laughs> I definitely want to be along as you go on that journey. And I know you'll be sharing with us what you learn. That is, I think the concept of embodiment is something that I've been trying to get my hands around. And I know that there's a lot more for me there. Yeah. On that path. Thank you. Sadly for me, we are already at the close of this interview, but I hope this will be the beginning of a lot more connection. And I so look forward to getting your book. Before we move to final acknowledgements and takeaways, I would love to hear what officially would you like to invite me and anyone listening to do in the way of a challenge or an invitation to more fully live our epic lives? Yeah. So since we've been talking a lot about having your support squad and I would invite you to take what I call 10 seconds of bravery. So finding a way to connect with someone in some way that you may have not talked yourself out of it, basically. Mm -hmm. So if there's someone that you're eyeing that you're like, oh, I would like to go deeper with this person. For example, one of my friends, the founder of The Practice for Women, I was actually her front desk receptionist many, many years ago. But I remember just making a claim of like, I want to go deeper with you. I, I like I said it out loud. And I don't think that we normally say that to our peers or friends. So just I want to spend more time with you. I want us to hang out more. And now we are super, super close. She's one of the people in the masterminds that I do and lean on and boxer and all of that. So it might be someone that you would love to go deeper with taking that 10 seconds of bravery to just send a text message, invite them, you know, for a cafe date or for a walk even, you know, that could be really nice. And then thinking about maybe like a mentor from afar or someone that you've just been admiring and send them an audio message via Instagram or post on something and just compliment them and thank them or even send an email without asking for anything in return but just to let them know how they have impacted your life. So some way of deepening that type of connection and receiving that support, or maybe you've been thinking about, oh, I need a little bit more emotional support. And I've been thinking about therapy, but I haven't actually taken action on it. Like whatever that thing is that you feel, whether it's the emotional support or the social support, or even the strategic support of just building out your network of influence, following that 10 seconds of bravery and just commit to do something that's a little bit bold and scary to do, but you only need to just write it. That's not too scary, but it's the sending it or the saying it. That's where the 10 seconds of bravery comes in. Mm, I love it so much. And I look forward to hopefully hearing lots of stories within the Mother's Quest community of who people choose to connect with. Yeah. With authenticity. And I can say as someone who has a podcast, that when somebody takes the time to reach back out to me and tell me that an episode they heard or something that I shared impacted them, it's so meaningful. Yeah. So sometimes there's this impression if we're sharing something with the world that that feedback is something that we always get. Yeah. It's not true. Sometimes you put things out in the world and you don't hear anything for a while. So 
it's also such a generous act. Yeah. Thing, yes. Absolutely. Way. Absolutely. Thank you for that challenge and for everything that you shared and this time with you and for pouring so much of your stories and your journey into your book, which I've just gotten a glimpse of so mm. far, but I can tell is really beautiful and is really benefiting from the many years that you allowed for the messages that you wanted to come through to simmer and to slow cook. Yeah. I would like to acknowledge you for some things that I'm taking away and clearer focus in this conversation is the power of metaphor again and language, thinking about blooming where we're planted, the slow cooker, the seasons, all of these things and the ways in which you communicate, I think, allow us to see ourselves and our lives in different ways that really resonate. So thank you for that gift that you have. I love that. Thank you. I fully received that. And acknowledgement from my side is just really appreciating these deep and thoughtful conversations and questions and curiosity that you bring to the table and also just being a light and a resource for fellow mamas because we need each other. You know, our world can become very isolated or disconnected, even though we're all connected electronically. I just think that we need more depth and intimacy and in how we show up in each other's lives. So just a beautiful resource that you have created for mothers to be fully seen and witnessed and held and connected. Mm, I fully receive and take in that. Thank you for the light that you are, Jada. And I look forward to listening and watching as this latest chapter in your life unfolds as you bring this book out to the world. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone wants, you know, I will have bonus chapters and things that people can get at shebuilds.com or anything at jadaselner.com too. Yes. And we'll make sure to link to all the good things in the show notes. I also want to put a final plug in for another generous act that you did was saying yes during one of my courageous asks to you around the time of the pandemic. It was another time when I had pressed pause just completely overwhelmed by all that was being asked of myself and moms at that time. And around Mother's Day, decided to do a manifesto challenge, a live version around this idea of choosing ourselves. And that acronym was an invitation to invite different moms to come in and speak on each of the choose guideposts. And yours was holding space for pause and reflection. And you shared some really amazing gems there. So I'll be sure to link in the show notes to what you shared with us oh, during that, that time. Thank you, Jada. So much appreciation for you and really excited to share this with everyone. Thank you, Julie. so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day, love your people, honor your gifts. Until next time.